Kia ora and welcome to Sobriety Chat. Uh, I am your host, Lotta Dad, otherwise known as Mrs. D. I am the community manager and content creator here at Living Sober. And today I am joined, this is very exciting, by Susie Morrison. Now, Susie is a peer advocate. She is an addiction specialist. She is an educator. She is a mother. She is a grandmother. She is my friend and she is sober. Welcome, Susie. Oh, thanks, Lotta. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Now, full disclosure, Susie and I know each other very well. Um, Susie is my mentor and supervisor with some of the jobs that I do and we've grown very close over the years. Um, how long have we known each other for now, Susie? Um, must be. I was going to say five, six, seven years. When did Living Sober start? We launched in 2014, August. Right, so it wasn't that long after that, right, I don't think. That That's right. Actually, yeah. And we used to sit and have a coffee and then slowly, oh, I just I just gained so much um, wisdom and knowledge and support from you and uh, the Living Sober members might not realise, you know, what a role you play behind the scenes. You have actually also written a number of pieces for us and I'll link to those in the blog post but for people who aren't haven't perhaps read these could you just tell us a little bit about your story and what led you into recovery Susie and how long ago was that now? <laughs> I'll lead with that last one um, so I celebrated 35 years of recovery on the 14th of February Valentine's Day I know I Amazing. didn't know at the time um, when I you know when I um I didn't know it was the 14th of February because things were very blurry back in those days. But when I tracked back on my first day saver, I realised and I thought, what a wonderful gift of love. Mm -hmm. So every year I get to celebrate that, which is amazing and something that I really thought, oh, I feel emotional too. Uh, I really thought wasn't possible. I had resigned myself to the fact that I was going to be the person who drank for the rest of her life because I couldn't see a way out at the time. A um, little bit about myself. What can I tell you? In what sort of way? What sort? Of, tell me what you want. Well, what was what was happening in those last years that led you into recovery? I mean, how was your life, and what was it like when you had to make that pivot into sobriety? Well, oh, it was awful, really. And um, you know about the secret stuff, right? You know all that trouble we go to to get enough of whatever we need to get through the day secretly mostly and um and then on the inside uh still feeling the shame and fear and the isolation and guilt and all of those sort of things because i didn't know that um alcohol you know alcohol being a drug i didn't know that it stopped working i didn't know that and what was happening for me in that last three years i didn't have uh, I say the last three years because the last three years were the toughest, I think, for me to get through because every morning I didn't have any um, actual suicidal ideation as um, thinking about ways to end my life. But every morning for that last three years, I woke up as soon as I woke up and I realized I was awake again and I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have to get through another day. And um, that's how my day started, you know, with that awful sinking feeling in my heart. And it's that inside stuff that is so crippling. And I was talking to someone about this yesterday. You know, you can see on the outside people who are struggling and you think you know what it's like, but it's that chipping away at your feelings of yourself and the world on the inside that is the worst, isn't it? Oh, it's horrible. And the thing is, I had no one to talk to about it. And I was in a relationship, um, long term relationship, two children, and um, my partner was really anti alcohol. I mean, we were using other substances as well, and alcohol was not considered not to be cool. And so um, I was able to sort of. The hierarchy. <laughs> the hierarchy of substances. I know. <laughs> I know it's so mad, isn't it? Anyway, um, I it was okay here. I uh, so it was these strategies, right? Like um, all the inside stuff, like constantly feeling um, like I was going to be found out. And I don't just mean found out about the drinking. I just mean like 
found out that I was such a mess on the inside because I was um, working at the time. I had two kids. I had a relationship. I really wanted to be the mum that fronted up at the PTA meetings and, um, you know, had dinner on the table at six o'clock every night and, and to be the friend and the partner and all that kind of thing. And I couldn't do it without substances. I couldn't do that without drinking every day. And so it was like um, I was able to openly drink about I don't know maybe it was a bottle of wine although there would be comments and my partner even though he wasn't that much into alcohol he would have a couple of glasses as a way of moderating my use um, but of course I was drinking more than that. Why and is it, was it like, so sorry I was just going to say when you say that you were in a relationship you had people around you you were in a job and you had no one to talk to I mean I was similar why is it that we feel so lonely and isolated when we are surrounded by people? Why do we hold it so tight? Well, I know for me, I had a lot of shame around it. I had so much shame around it. I just wanted to be able to drink like other people do. I wanted to be the person who could pour a glass of wine and have a glass of wine and then carry on I didn't want to be the person who went to pour the glass of wine had filled one up knocked it back and then walked casually back into the room with the other one you know making it look like that's the one I'd had and um I I was so ashamed that I couldn't control it I really I tried everything I tried different you know I stopped drinking brandy and started drinking wine or I you know sort of moving things around and and then um Oh, and the blackouts, you see, I was deeply ashamed. I had blackouts. I had a lot of blackouts. and I, I never, never had a blackout. Yeah. Oh, it's awful because uh, I never, ever told anyone until I got into recovery that I did have blackouts. And mm. um, it's like piecing together uh, the next day just through sort of signals, you know, how was my behaviour the night before because it's completely gone. And, um, you know, the hope was that I was behaving well but, who knows? Yeah. And um, and then living with that, I thought if people knew how much trouble I was in with alcohol, that it would be taken away from me somehow. And I really did think it was my lifeline. Yeah, so there's so much going on. Um, blackouts, just quickly, I didn't really realise until I read a book actually called Blackout by a woman called Sarah Heppler. It's a really good book. Um you know what they were I, I'd had brownouts I suppose you could call them where my memory was a bit blurry and I'd be looking at the you know the bank statement to see where I spent my money but I'd never had those nights where you know when you're in a blackout you're actually you're operating you're talking you're walking you're you're having sex whatever but your brain has literally stopped storing those memories so you, outwardly you're still you're not in a coma you're still moving around doing things, but your brain, there is literally no memory being stored. So they are terrifying from what I understand. They are terrifying. And, you know, Lotta, I had my first blackout when I was 18. And I didn't stop drinking till I was 39. And I didn't always black out, but I had a lot of them through the years, throughout the years. And um, I was thinking about it the other day because it's been my anniversary week and reflecting back and... <clears throat> and I remembered, you know, that very first blackout and it, oh, it was terrifying and I didn't know what it was and I didn't know how to find out what it was, who to ask and um, I just kept it to myself. Mm. So when, I know it was 35 years ago now, but can you remember, <laughs> yeah. you know, what the kind of key things that you sort of had to work on when you entered into recovery, the kind of habit changes or self-care? I mean, I know a lot goes on. Gosh, even in my 10 years, so much has happened in terms of my life and myself and all of it. <laughs> but what were the key sort of things for you that you really had to work on and change after you got sober? Mm. <clears throat> it's interesting that stuff, you know, like the first 18 months I've been working in addiction for years and I've found out a lot now, but of course I didn't know anything at all then. But the, the most accelerated period of growth takes place in the first 18 months when people 
put down the alcohol and start making some changes and then you know quite quickly again for the next five years and I mean two or five years and well one of the things that um, I did and you don't hear it talked about but I was so scared that I was going to pick up alcohol again that I um, as an extra addition to my um, making a decision just for today because what I did um, for me is I went into a 12-step program for people who are recovering because I couldn't do this on my own. I didn't go willingly, by the way. And um, But I was sitting in this room. I was in a treatment centre. I went to a treatment centre. Um, and um, what happened for me there when I was being assessed, I was still so ashamed. You'd think, right, I'd be talking about it all there. I was getting assessed and I kept the amount of alcohol I was drinking well, the other side of it is too, I didn't really know how much I was drinking because of the secrecy, how can you keep track? But anyway, I didn't, um, I wasn't forthcoming with that and consequently three days later I woke up, you know, in my bed surrounded by the health professionals. I'd had a massive seizure in the grounds and of oh, this is in Queen oh Mary God. Hospital, yeah, in Hanmer Springs. Now, I didn't know about withdrawals from alcohol. That was the first time I knew about them was when I came to and they, and they explained it to me. And, and from that moment on, I just disclosed everything yeah. because that gave me such a fright. And because um, alcohol being such a so easily available and, um, well, I don't know what it's like in Wellington, but I can just go up to the local supermarket here and it's in the oh, yeah. aisle by yeah. the health food. Oh, yes, it's next to the pesto and hummus and my yeah, supermarket. Yeah, 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 right. So I'm going down that aisle. But um, what I did is I took um, disulfiram for every day for a year, which is called antibuse is its name. Yeah. And it's this, um, I did that and I felt really good about that because I would I had some little rituals, you know, replacing the morning rituals of my when I was um, drinking and using other drugs. So uh, a daily reading and I would take the disulfiram and I thought, okay, I know just for today, no matter what happens, I'm not going to pick up a drink. So that took the pressure off me and it was like an insurance policy really and it worked really well for me. I took that every day for a year and then I felt like, um, well, you know, I'd learned a whole bunch of other tools by then, like you yeah. say, about how to learn how to live well because I didn't want to just be abstinent I wanted to have a recovery and and you know and you've heard me say this there's a really big difference between abstinence and recovery right abstinence is an event and recovery is a process of growth and change and you know full fulfilling potential of who you know I'm I could be a all that kind of stuff. So I started um, going to regular 12-step meetings and um, meeting like-minded people. I found my tribe. Yeah. And um, I began, and the other thing, the thing that really got my attention prior to that, and, and um, I see this happening on Living Sober, which is so beautiful, you know that secret stuff, all that inside stuff, and, and they made us go to 12-step meetings and in treatment and I was like, oh for God's sake. But anyway, I heard people talking about that inside stuff. They were talking about the fear, the isolation, the shame and the guilt and the loneliness because it's very lonely being that person mm. who's trying to make it look all okay on the outside. Mm. It's exhausting. And feeling and absolutely, absolutely exhausting. And um, I heard people talking about that and some of those people hadn't had a drink for weeks or months and a couple of people staff members hadn't for years and I got this little the, the hope I didn't know I had any left maybe I didn't maybe they had the hope and anyway a little flame was fanned and I started thinking oh maybe if they can maybe I can and then um what happened? Oh, what else happened was when I was um, I was there, I uh, had this realization as I learned a bit more about addiction and how it works, and you know, it's not what we take; it's where it takes us. And and that you know, my experience was an experience of common humanity with every person who was there. So I was with a group of people for the first time who were talking about the inside stuff, and I thought, I'm not alone. If mm. they can do it, maybe I can do it. And for me. Um, I realized it's easier for me to have none than one. So yeah. that's how I started out. And that's why I decided to um, go to a 12-step program. And that's why I just, because I knew I couldn't do it. I could, knew I could do it 
with holding on by my fingernails do it, but I didn't want that. I wanted to um, learn to live with ease and, mm. you know, with my insides and outsides matching. Oh, yeah, and when you get to that point, it is it is incredible. I mean, I just was posting on my social media this morning about the, just feeling like you're living authentically, and it's such a cliched word, I'm so authentic, but when you actually live it and feel it, it's so powerful. But, hey, I just wanted to, before we go on, because I do want to talk more about that collective um, and not feeling alone and how powerful that is, because that's basically what, you know, that's their co our ethos of yeah. living sober. That's what we're all about. I just want to go back to what you said about the most accelerated growth happening in the first 18 months, because I can remember talking to you when I was about three or maybe four years sober, and it was my soberversary, and I was celebrating, and I said to you, oh, God, last year was the most revealing yet. And you just <laughs> looked at me and said, that's the way it goes, Lotta. If, and it's true. Every year, oh, every yeah. milestone, I look back and I go, gosh, that last year, you think you've learned it all, but that last year, whoa, that was the real teacher. <laughs> so we often say to people on our site, because most of our members are in those early, really early crunchy stages, and they are in that period of huge growth, but also learning how to reparent themselves maybe or deal with emotions or just deal with cravings or deal with socializing everything you know deal with yeah. the world telling us to drink and all of what's going on and we just say to them all the time is hold on hold on hold on promise you it, it changes and it gets easier but you've just got to get through this early phase because it's it's really hard isn't it Oh, that's right. So I would say, you know, hold on to your seat because it's an exciting ride and, um, and um, you know, more will be revealed. And keeping it in the day, I found that really, really helpful. Just keep, keep I learned, um, someone wise taught me early on or that as long as I don't pick up today, no matter what else happens, it's been a successful day. And I found that really, really helpful because um, by the time I got into recovery, no, nothing I did was enough. It wasn't good enough. And I was totally um, convinced that I was a deeply flawed human being and that if you knew that about me, then, you know, end the sentence yourself. But I think yeah. basically if you knew that about me, you wouldn't love me. I mean, we all want to be loved, right? And um, and so, you know, hence the double life, the sort of trying to sound and look like everything's okay on the inside while I'm on the outside, while on the inside believing that I'm unworthy of love. That's the core of it. If you feel like that, how are you going to allow or, or at least, you know, let in anyone else feeling like that about you if you don't genuinely yes. feel that about yourself? And that's what goes on. That's what you're forced into doing when you put down alcohol and other drugs is is having that connection with yourself. That's right, via other people. And so I, um, the first thing I that I noted as a success was um, as long as I don't pick up today, no matter what else happens, I've had a successful day. And I love that languaging around successful day. I've never had a successful day in my life, I don't think. No matter what I'd been doing, it wouldn't have been enough. It wouldn't have been good enough. You might think it was enough, but I knew it wasn't, that kind of thing. So living with that very unfriendly relationship with myself and um, recovery for me has been about becoming, this is another cliche, but it doesn't matter. Cliches are there for a reason. You know, I was going to say becoming my own best friend. And by that, I mean developing a really um, friendly, easy, forgiving and compassionate relationship with myself. But was that hard, Susie? I mean, come on. Well, when you go I from don't... that place of not liking yourself, trusting yourself, respecting yourself, it takes time, right? It doesn't just happen overnight. It takes overnight. time, yeah. It takes time. It takes time. Absolutely right. I, was it hard? Um, it Well, see, the thing about there's some transferable skills, right? To keep a habit going, you've got to be creative, resourceful, and determined among other things, uh, that resourcefulness, that creativity and that determination can transfer over into recovery. And if I even put, um, and I don't know where I got this from, I thought if I, even, and I was exhausted, you know what I'm talking about, right? Just, just keeping my head above water until I couldn't. Um, 
I thought if I can transfer even 10% of the energy I put into the drinking and keeping it a secret and living with myself and pretending to be okay into recovery and being out about it and saying to people, I can't do this, it's too hard. And they say, yes, you can. All you've got to do is do it today. And then, um, you know, slowly, slowly, um, things begin to turn around. They do. You know, just, yeah, replacing. Um, I mean, I am a creature of habit. I love routines and rituals. I've had it. I know you do. <laughs> I've been reading the same daily reading book for 35 years. It's one of them's fallen apart and the other one's starting to look like that too. And and I love that because I think, oh, you know, this is what I do now. I wake up in the morning and um, I make a decision no matter what happens today, I'm not going to pick up. I still do that because I can and I love that. And in that moment, um, I've, you know, making a decision is very powerful. So year after day in, day out, week in, month in, month out, year in, year out, making that decision that no matter what happens today, I'm, you know, I'm having, a, if I don't pick up, I'm having a successful day. So what happens then is it's not like you have to actually go out, although there's lots of things to do as they pop up, but um, self-esteem begins naturally to grow. As the days go by, self-esteem grows. And um, that it's like uh, as that behaviour reduces, the, the other stuff grows like a garden, really. But some days are hard. I mean, oh, come yeah, on. Some are. days are so hard. We, we lose people we love, you know, or we lose jobs or we, we get hurt. Like... You know, it, it is so simple. Just for today, I'm not going to pick up. I'm not going to yeah. have a drink. But then we have to acknowledge some of those days are going to suck. Oh, they're totally suck. <laughs> some of those oh, days are going to suck. And, and you might feel really uncomfortable all day. That, but you're right. It's that thing of like even if you go to bed and you've been grumpy or you've felt bad, that's because I always felt like there was something wrong. Yeah. I always felt there was something wrong if I'd had a bad day. Oh, this is wrong. You know, this is wrong. It's wrong, and then I'd go to bed, and I think that was wrong. And now yeah. I know actually, but that's no, that's just what it is. But that feeling of it being wrong, and it's hard to kind of marry with that success of, but you didn't drink. That's right. Yeah, the thing is, and I know that wrongness thing too. And um, I mean, I'm a parent. I had two kids. My, um, I still have two kids. Um, my daughter was one daughter was six, and the other was fourteen. And they had to. We all had to learn how to live a life with someone who's learning how to live without using alcohol and other drugs. Now, their life had been very unconventional up to that point. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's tough being a parent anyway. I've yet to meet a parent who doesn't feel guilty about something they've done or not done. Well, I knew so many things that um, I had done and the neglect and the stuff around my kids. It's my greatest regret. I don't lose sleep over it about you know sometimes people say they've got no regrets I do regret that's my regret about the neglect um that my, and you know my kids went through um during those years of active addiction for me and some days yes it's all wrong no matter so what do you what. do about that regret because that does come up on our site as well that people say how do I move past this this shame or guilt I have for this very concrete thing that happened or I did or whatever like how do you learn where to put that and what to do with it yeah well you see um there's no sort of simple answer to that but because I'm in a 12-step program you know I've written and and shared and practiced the steps for years and and with that regret I mean there's a couple of things that happen you know like um I mean, it's in there, and some of my friends know this, and I'm saying it out here because you all know what I'm talking about, right? Everyone who's been a parent. Um, I do have to have some compassion for myself. I've made amends, you know, uh, to the kids, the adults now with children of their own, um, and along the way, 
uh, what I had to do or what I felt like I needed to do was really support them because, you know, with addiction, as you know, no matter what the substance, it negatively impacts on families and recovery positively impacts on families and that um, positive impact is not an easy ride. That's what I mean. Hold on to your seat and strap it yeah. in because you don't know <laughs> where you're going to go with this. And so um, making a point of being there for the kids today and in recent years I did this um I said to my something must have come up and I was talking to my daughter my youngest daughter and about something and it must have been my uh, something about what happened in the past and and she said mum it's okay I'm okay with that just be a really good grandmother Oh, I love that. And let I it be said too. also that your daughters um, also do amazing work now and give back based on what they went through and experienced and learned. And so they're now also equally as valuable members of society with that lived experience. So yeah, that's yeah, right. we, can't, we can't ignore the, the perhaps negatives or downsides, but we can also focus on the positives. And, you know, that's what they say. There's research, as we know, that says yes. that, you know, people in recovery are some of our most valuable members of society because they they do give back and they want to help. And they've, and they've had to go through that grittiness and to become who they are. And, I mean, that, that's – I love that because it flies in the face of all that shame and stigma that we felt – and it's like, actually, I'm not ashamed that I'm in recovery because, you know, it makes me a really valuable person and I've, I've turned my life around. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that David Vest. There's a guy called David Vest. He does research and he says, you know, for people who are in recovery, you know, and they've got, um, they get to their five years or more and they've done that research, they're um, weller than well, as it were. And in fact, um, people in that, considered long-term recovery do more service in the community they'd be your ideal neighbors that kind of thing and um, I love that I love that affirmation from the um you know from the what's the word I'm looking for just you know we know it right as a recovery group we know that things change we know that we get better we know that we move from self-obsession into um supporting other people we know all of that but to get that um, acknowledgement from the establishment. Yeah. Uh, I love that. But just um, in terms of that regret, like um, just in practical terms, because every now and then I could be driving the car, it just, you know, it comes up and I go, I can feel it in my heart, you know, something that I've remembered. I might have driven past a house here in Auckland or something. Anyway, the memory pops up and I can feel it in my body and um, I just say it's you know, oh, Amy or Alyssa, you know, oh, God, I'm so sorry. And I say, it's okay, Suze, this is okay. And I, you know, really speak to myself in that way, you know, because the, like you said about reparenting, we do have to become our own yeah. parent, right? I and, love that and, compassion as well, that self-compassion. Yeah. We need to become our own nurturing parent, which some days, of course, is easier than others. And as time goes by, it gets easier and easier. But at the very beginning, um, the thought of having compassion for myself, uh, I wanted you to think that I had that going on. You know, the people that on the inside, my inside still didn't match my outsides, you know, because I still felt like you were saying I did feel wrong on the inside. But what I did do, because what I learned, right, we cannot think our way into mental health. We've got to take some actions. So yeah. I did that, you know, not picking up every day, beginning to do some service and, um, you know, just um, learning how to be a mum and fronting up and learning how to be a partner and fronting up and that kind of thing. And slowly, slowly things change. They just do um Oh, I lost track of my thought there. With I just that. wanted to pick up on the service thing because I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in the 12 step model, being of service is things like helping out at meetings and, you know, um, I don't know, being a sponsor. I don't know, whatever the, the, the official way of being of service in the 12 step mm. is. At Living Sober, we have our own version of that giving back, being of service thing, which is all about. Um, commenting and supporting other members and so I often watch people they'll join and they might lurk for a while and then they'll start writing their own updates and there's always that turning point yeah. where they start um, they start welcoming in new members because we get a little notification and then they start 
commenting and lifting up and supporting other members. And that's when they're taking what, you know, they're doing, their recovery and what the site offers to a new level because that in turn lifts up, up lifts us up and makes yes. us feel good about ourselves, right? That's right. And it's wonderful. I love that. And it's exactly how it works because that's what we're doing. We're uffying other people and we're giving back what was so freely given to us. So it continues. There's an energy, right? We're just sharing the love, basically. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're not trying to fix anyone. We're just saying, hey, it's so great to see you and, um, you know, thumbs up and those yeah. lovely warm – because, um, you know, when people come in the door, as you know, we're still so full of guilt and shame and, and self-judgment is really, really full on. And, having and fear, that, a the lot of fear. fear the fear. You know, because the fear of actually can, stopping. <laughs> oh, it's terrifying, isn't it? And what are you going to do with all your time? What are you going to do? Oh. I mean, you know, it's like who, who does that? You know, when, especially with alcohol, this drug, which is so normalized, glorified, that's everywhere. You know, I, I often talk about at the point where I was about to quit, I felt like I was standing on the edge of a cliff looking into this black abyss and yeah. of nothingness. The fun is going to stop. Yeah. I'm going to be boring, Lotta. No one's going to want to hang out with me. Oh, my gosh. You know, and I was already projecting into the future these events, you know, like my children's weddings. They were five and three at the time, and I was already at their imaginary <laughs> wedding in the future, miserable, because I couldn't drink. That was the hold I had on it. And I was stand uh, it had on me, I should say. And it was like I was standing on the edge of this cliff, looking into this blackness, and jumped. Oh, I the, know. That's, the, that's why we're all legends because we jump and we go for whatever reason I'm not going to do that anymore oh it's amazing that emotional bungee jump and that's exactly what it is and um you know that saying um oh my god oh you know what am I going to do at so and so's 21st when everyone's drinking and having a fabulous time and I'll be the wowser in the corner and I can't even celebrate my own son's 21st and all that stuff and all that stuff lives in the future that's why it's so great to just bring it back to the day and um you know what's happening today it takes all the feeling because of course when we're having those thoughts we're also having the feelings around you know, I'm sad in the corner while everyone's, you know, having a wonderful time. Yeah. And, you know, with alcohol, it's an interesting drug because it's legal and because it's even more than legal because it's so, um, well, it's the only drug we have to justify not using. Oh, I know. It's <laughs> crazy. Come on. Yeah. Why aren't, you yeah. Why aren't you drinking? Like, what? Would they say that about anything else? Why aren't you doing heroin? Yeah, come on, come <laughs> on have a line of speed, you know, yeah. like, um, just come on, loosen up, just have one. Not that I, you know, and my experience has been amazing really around that because um, people haven't pushed alcohol on me. In fact, I had a revelation when I was a few months in recovery and I had another friend who got into recovery around about the same time as me and we were, you know, we had a sort of similar social scene and it was a special friend's birthday or some kind of celebration and anyway we decided we'd go together and we made the plan and we thought okay we'll go we'll have an exit strategy and um we'll just be together and if it's too much um we'll just go you know the kinds of things that you do to keep safe and just anyway um what i thought was well, i said oh you know everyone's going to be so out of it on alcohol and weed well it turns out they weren't <laughs> It was yeah. me and yeah. one other guy here. The yeah. rest of them were just having a really good time and just taking it yeah. or leaving it. And I thought, That's oh. one of the amazing things, isn't it? You start realising that not everyone's boozing like you do. And yeah. can I also just say, I have had some of the best times at parties sober, dancing all night, <laughs> chatting, the little quiet little chats that you might have off to the yeah. side right at the end of the night with someone else who's not wasted, by the way. Right. And, uh, you know, those lovely, memorable moments. Some parties are terrible. Some parties aren't fun. They're not your gang of people. You're not in the right mood. Your clothes don't fit. You just it doesn't work. Mm. And But don't go home and think that's just because you weren't drinking. That just wasn't your party. That's you know, right. It, it, yeah. It's, re it's not about the liquid we give it the all the power to this imaginary glass of liquid and it's mm. not about that it's about all these other factors that are inherent yeah totally agree yeah some parties just aren't for us whether we were drinking or not 
<laughs> um, oh, so great chatting to you, Susie, and I just really appreciate all that you do for um, me and my work here at Living Sober and um, the other stuff that we do together. We facilitate workshops on addiction together, which is always a joy, and yeah. 30, 35 years, how amazing. I mean, I can't even... There'll be people watching this who can't even imagine getting to that place. And what do you want to say to them? Final words, Susie. Uh, well, what I was going to say, like anyone who is watching, it's so wonderful that you're here. No matter what got you here, if you're just checking it out or if you're in recovery a few days, a few weeks, a few months or a few years, um, you know, just keep uh, coming back. And living sober is a joy and it's something that um, – is so accessible to so many people and that kindness and compassion and warmth and connection that's what it's all about that is the opposite of addiction that's the opposite of the loneliness and the fear and the shame and the guilt and the, all of that stuff anxiety that um you know i know i lived with as a child actually and you know it wasn't soothed until i picked up that first drink and then that worked well for a while and then it didn't and then it compounded all that and compounded all that and became terrifying and and now we're here we're here together you're not on your own you know we don't have to do this stuff on our own and um it is only love that heals and that's a, a loving action every day you don't pick up isn't loving action towards you and others and if you do pick up that's okay you can just start again we can begin anew awesome well thank mm. you very much that's a lovely note to end on much love to you Susie yeah Bye. love to everyone thanks Lotta thanks for all you do see ya